Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 27, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. Now, if you're a new listener to the show, uh, we are 27 episodes in. First of all, where have you been? Yeah. Um, secondly, welcome on board. And uh, we do the show every single Friday the show comes out. Explain how it works, Ravi, for those that may be new. Okay, so first off, we have news and opinions. And these are usually kind of things that me and Dan have just been searching through in the week or listeners have submitted and they've got our interest so we kind of talk about that and keep you updated in the retro scene but then we have a special guest in the second half every single week the main event now uh, this week it's actually a guy who um we've had a lot of requests for this guy um whenever i chat to people they're always like oh, can you try and get him on and whenever we have other musicians who worked on like the commodore 64 or the amiga and they list their biggest influences and people they really look up to this guy's name always gets mentioned every single time. Yeah, Chris Horsbeck. He's <laughs> what <done> a legend. <laughs> over 70 game soundtracks, including Turrican, the great Guiana sisters, and even Scooter have sampled his tunes. That's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we'll find out more about that in just a bit because I think, you know, a lot of like musicians now are kind of seeing the Commodore 64 and the Amiga scene as kind of rich pickings for like these gritty raw samples now, aren't yeah. they? And also, if you talk about Euro scene and you talk about the Euro scene of gaming, mm-hmm. Chris Horsbeck music was at the center of it i think well even like you know going right back to it i mean he um you could kind of trace the first you know trackers trackers really yeah. came out of yeah. a, a you know a program that he wrote on the commodore 64 so you could call him the father of like mods and trackers really couldn't you yeah you had the kind of development of uh technology and you know the music technology digital music technology is down to this guy so uh, we'll get more into that in the next half an hour chris heels on the retro hour in the next 30 minutes now, if you have got any news stories you want to submit, by the way, um, we, we did check the back end of our website and we found about 20 emails that we only just spotted. This, this so. is bad. I set up this submit news section on the website <laughs> and I was like, oh, we're not getting much interactivity. And then I checked it the other day and we had like four Microsoft Word pages <laughs> with <laughs> really <emails>. nice <laughs> written letters. And I was like, oh, God, Dan, <laughs> look at this. So, uh, yeah, sorry, guys. It was in a different bit of the back end of the website. We didn't spot until this week, so we're not being ignorant. We'll, we'll get back to everyone eventually. Yeah. But you can submit any new stories um, either through the website, theretrohour.com, or just get us on Twitter, at Retro Hour UK. Right into this week's stories. Now, this kind of ties back. Um, I don't seem like, you know, we're hating on Nintendo too much because last week we did have that discussion about the um, the NX and the Wii U and kind of, you know, have they learned their lessons from its failure. And we have got quite a positive Nintendo story on the way, first of all. But this one kind of ties back to a guest that we had on the show a couple of weeks ago. Now, this, this is was- Sam Dyer, wasn't it? A bit map books yeah so he's a guy that did the um visual compendium books for the commodore 64 and the amiga and uh, gremlin graphics the arcade book we were talking about lovely guy and we had him on the show and he mentioned that he wanted to do a book um about the the nez the yeah he actually had a kickstarter up didn't he for it yeah and this has been running quite a while i think um he got to 170,000 quid he'd actually raised on there so a lot of interest in this and then um one day a little bit earlier on this week People that want to go on Kickstarter and kind of check out this project's going. Instead of getting the campaign up, um, there was actually a DMCA takedown notice by Nintendo saying, you're infringing our copyright, you can't release a book, basically. Yeah. And I'm sure this guy's got all the legal grounds covered as well because he's released lots of books before. But I think this is just a, a case of Nintendo being a bit brash, as they usually are. You know, YouTube, you don't have any Let's Plays or you don't have any Nintendo videos because they're always doing takedowns on them. There are some big YouTube channels because, I mean, if you don't know how YouTube works, if you get you get a copyright claim on a video, that just means, like, you know, they kind of take your, your ad revenue. You get a copyright strike, which a lot of big YouTubers who've been doing Nintendo videos have got from Nintendo, mm. and you get three of them, your channel gets shut down. Yeah, it's like baseball. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> three yeah. strikes and you're out, it is, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but yeah, Nintendo have been doing this for a couple of years now. There's people who've, you know, put up like 10 minute, just like gameplay footage of their yeah. games, which, you know, is how you promote games in 2016, isn't it? Well, that's it as well. When you know he's doing something, a visual compendium, which mm-hmm. is going to get people's memories going and they go, oh, I remember Zelda. Mm-hmm. And then they go, oh, there's a new Zelda coming out for the NX. So, Well, you make you a know, good point there because all of the, you know, it, it's a book looking at the, the NES, it's not like recent Nintendo stuff. Yeah. So all the graphics in this are 30 years old. They're not really. I, I think there's no point in doing them, to be honest. I think if they do these small takedowns, what's the point? Because all they're going to do is get negative press. Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, you know, the people that are wanting to get these books are Nintendo's hardcore enthusiasts, the fans who've been there for 30 years. Yeah. 
And, you know, it just seems to me like, yeah, I, lo- I love Nintendo's games, but it just seems, as a company, they're so stuck like 20 years ago. Totally. So, uh, but the good thing is, I mean, you know, we've obviously had Sam on the show, and he is trying to sort this out with Nintendo at the moment. He's talking to Nintendo UK. And some of the fans want to see this. I'm sure he'll work out the details. And uh, Yeah, I'm sure it'll work out in the end. So, uh, if, if you know, if you have about the Kickstarter, um, just keep an eye on it. We'll put, put the links in our show notes at theretrohour.com, and fingers crossed he can get this book out, because it looks so good. Yeah, it looks amazing, and the uh, Amiga Visual Compendium was great, so we'll hope for this one. Now, we've been busy this week, haven't we? We've been uh, appearing on another show. Yeah, this is about the Amiga, because... RGDS, which is Retro Gaming Discussion Show, Mm -hmm. they have a great podcast where they have multiple hosts that come from different podcasts, they have their own group, and they talk about everything. So they did a massive N64 one the other day. It's kind of theme shows they do, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's always kind of themed on a subject like Dreamcast or N64. And this one's the Amiga show. So we went on with Aaron and Garen. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, we did it over Skype and... um, it's going to be out at the moment, so you can listen to us twice talk about Amiga if you want. If you, if you can't get enough of us in a, in one hour, you can have two this week. Yeah. <laughs> so that's essentially what we did, though, isn't it? I mean, it's because uh, like you said, their shows are kind of themed around different topics. So last week, Thursday evening, we sat down. Um, we did them from home as well, rather than having to come in the studio, which was quite nice. Yep. Did it in my pyjamas, my Superman pyjamas. <laughs> and we just talked. There was like no direction at, at the beginning. It's just free flow. Let's chat about the Amiga for an hour or so, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, but we, we, we all had similar kind of things that shared experiences Mm -hmm. so it was quite good because we you know triggering memories and stuff yeah i'll enjoy it i think we spent about five minutes talking about x copy (laughs) oh yeah yeah there's a bit of dodgy chat in there so uh, yeah if you i mean obviously aaron was a guy we were talking about last week who did the uh you know the the amiga mod that shaggy has uh noticed so uh, we talk about that as well but yeah if you've never checked out the rgds podcast before if you love our show I'm sure you'll love this, these guys' program as well. So uh, we'll pop a link to uh, their latest episode in the show notes at theretrohour.com. Uh, now get back to Nintendo. Oh, back. Yep. We've got some positive news this time. Hey. We've talked about Everdrives before on the show. They're, they're so cool. Now, yeah. there have been calls for a, uh, a Game Boy Advance Everdrive. Now, there have been other kind of flashcards released for the Advance, um, but none quite as slick as what, you know, Cricks comes out with. Yeah. And this one, um, basically it's got you know, all the bells and whistle- whistles in there to make um, pretty much every game work on, on, the, on the flash cart. So a lot of these other ones, kind of third-party ones, and a lot of the features aren't in there, so they're not all compatible. But by the looks of this, I mean, pretty much anything will work with it. It boasts near 100% compatibility. Um, it's got um, even the big 256 megabit ROMs work on it. It's also got um, one megabyte SRAM slots in there as well. Even stuff like the Pokemon series that wouldn't work mm. under the flash carts work because it's got real-time clock support and all that too. Wow. So. Well, this is really advanced because I remember when the uh, Game Boy came out and this was the Game Boy Advance, mm-hmm. there was also a lot of writers and readers that came out for carts and blank carts, but uh, they didn't work all the time and it was a real faff yeah. to get anything copied running on there. So this is ace. Well, I've yeah. always been a big fan of Everdrives anyway. I mean, I've got an Everdrive for pretty much all of my cartridge-based systems and, you know, they are expensive... And this one is actually not that bad, though. I mean, it's um, $99 it's selling for. So it's actually, you know, cheaper than the ones for the Mega Drive and the Super Nintendo. About 60 quid, isn't it? And, uh, well, I don't know with a bit the bit more now. <laughs> no, yeah, but we'll see. Yeah, we're about <laughs> £99 soon, probably. <laughs> um, but, I mean, you know, a lot of people whinge about Everdrives when you see them online. They're like, mm, it's too expensive. If you want to buy every single game for, like, you know, the Game Boy Advance, it costs you a hell of a lot more than $99. But also, this is really nice. You're not, it's not like you've got a giant box hanging out the back of your <laughs> Game Boy Advance. You know, it's a nicely little fitted cart yeah and it's even you know you got the little um slick logo on the top there as well and uh, i think it uses like a micro sd card in the top too so it is really small and compact and essentially download all your roms and just uh play away so yeah ace and they're taking pre-orders now and they're expecting them to be dispatched between uh well 15th of july and the 15th of august so if you pre-ordered it you'll get it in the next month well i see i go to these game shows and i see a lot of game boy advances Mm -hmm. and they're always they, they do all these modifications on them. So they have like LED backlit kits and everything. I think there must be a real scene where Game Boy Advances are like held in prestige. But so. they're still quite cheap though as well. I saw one in town the other day for about 15 quid. Oh, which um, okay. you know, which is quite rare. Some of these mods are around 90 to 100 pounds that people are spending on them, you know, hmm. with LEDs and getting all the back. It's great. But right. I think, you know, it's probably a scene that you should, you know, if you can get one on the cheap now, get it while you can, because like yeah. all Nintendo stuff, it's going to get valuable, isn't it? They always do. Definitely. So uh, if you want to find out where you can order those carts from, we'll uh, pop a link in our show notes at theretrohour.com. 
Now, um, the BBC Micro, which is uh, not a machine we've covered heavily on this show before, but, you know, one that we've all kind of got a shared heritage of because of uh, going to school in the 80s and 90s. Yeah, yeah. And uh, someone's actually made a little add-on that means you can bump this up to 100 megahertz. <laughs> This is absolutely crazy. I was looking at it, and I'm I'm a member of a, a BBC group on yeah. Facebook, and uh, this just popped up, and they were like, 100 megahertz for £10. And I was like, wait, the vampire for the Amiga is like 160 or something? Mm. So how can they do it for £10? And of course, the architecture for the ARM processor can be used as a coprocessor. So what they're doing is they're using the Raspberry Pi connecting it to this tube port and then using it as a coprocessor on the Acorn. So your main processor can be 2 megahertz. Your coprocessor could be 100. <laughs> it's absolutely crazy. And, you know, they're even saying you can use this on, like, the, the Acorn Atom or the um, Electron if you've got, like, you know, a tube interface on there as well. Um, and it's just a breadboard at the moment, which they've basically gone off the GPIO pins on the um, Raspberry Pi. I don't know if they've got any software to actually use the co-processor yet. <laughs> well, by the looks of this, I mean, only, um, you know, Friday, June 17th. So it was only like less than a month ago this project started. Um, and at the moment, like you said, it is like a, <laughs> it is a breadboard. It just wires everywhere, isn't yeah, it? But yeah. um, you can actually build this thing for 10 quid and they give you a breakdown. And they've put all the source on that on GitHub. So, you know, it's open source. Anyone can build one. And all you need is a Raspberry Pi. And they're actually showing this with a Raspberry Pi Zero. Which, but uh, to me, it's like a graphics card or something. It's like a GPU. You know, it's an extra CPU that's really, really at, like powerful compared to the original. And maybe you could use this for video processing or... Well, they are you know, saying that. Apparently, um, you know, they're coming up with some uh, extra bits of software now that will let you use the uh, yeah the Pi's GPU to give VGA or uh, HDMI output for, like, the BBC. HDMI, yeah. <laughs> like 1080p on the uh, BBC. <laughs> yeah, imagine how sharp Elite would look on that. Oh, great. <laughs> but, you know, t to me, like... Because of the Beeb's heritage, and it was always like the education machine, Yeah. Um, you know, back in the day, it's just kind of cool to see that these... Because I remember being at school, and we'd build like little FM radios, and like, you know, we'd have little, little like logo turtles and robots and stuff, yeah. and all be stuff that, you know, interface with the BBC Micro. And it was all Archimedes, wasn't it? It was all based on the arm. Yeah, well, that uh, was the successor, yeah. yeah. So it's, um, I, I think this is dead cool. Like you Maybe said, uh, the iPhone, actually, you might be able to hook that up. You have to jailbait your iPhone. No way would Apple let you do that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, uh, 2 megahertz to 100 is quite a bump, isn't it, for a tenner? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, really interesting stuff. Now, um, speaking of stuff that we maybe haven't seen before, and uh, another company that's been around for many years and has got quite a long heritage, you've been looking at some uh, Apple prototypes. Now, uh, a listener actually sent this in. Yeah. And the listener's name is Frank Kalija. Thank you for this, Frank. This is really interesting. This is a look at Apple's lost prototypes. Yeah, and uh, it appears that this guy, Hartmut Esslinger, <laughs> sorry, my <laughs> pronunciations are... Hartmut, I think. Hartmut Esslinger. Esslinger, yeah. yeah. He's basically done a book, and he did a lot of the old designs for Apple. Mm -hmm. And these are the kind of rejected prototypes. Now, this book's called Keep It Simple. And they say that he was the guy who basically, um, in the early days of Apple, he kind of taught Steve Jobs to put design first and foremost. Yeah. Kind of put that in his mind. And um, I think this, this book's been around for a year or so now, but they've actually put a few pictures up on The Verge. So looking through, I mean, it's bizarre because a lot of these are from the 80s and 90s, mm. but some of them actually look quite contemporary. There's like a picture of a laptop here that could be, you know, you see stuff like the um, the new HP laptops, those kind of funky coloured ones, and they look pretty similar to this. Yeah, th then they've got some absolute strange things, which is this tablet called Bashful. Looks like a Newton a bit, doesn't it? Looks like a Newton, but then they've got this like TV dinner tray where you can add a keyboard and then a big fat external floppy <laughs> in at the top. It's and very you, odd. You not exaggerating when you say TV dinner tray, it looks exactly like one. It's even got handles on the side and it's bright pink. Yeah, it's like really bad. And then they have a kind of this early, I don't know, Apple calculator watch or phone watch, it looks like. This looks like a mobile phone, doesn't it? But it's got the old... Um, or with a headset. It looks a bit like uh, the Motorola Razr flip phone. Yeah, yeah. But it's got the old like 80s and 90s stripey Apple logo on, so it must have been before, you know, before the 2000s. But there are some really quite beautiful designs. In this, actually. I think there are some hideous ones as well, if you go <laughs> further down. Apple have never been famed for making good computer mice, and there are some pretty dodgy-looking computer mice as you scroll oh, down yeah. a bit further. They look pretty painful. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's a, some very triangular-shaped mice, so 
Yeah, that, that mouse is an RSI claim waiting to happen, isn't it? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's on the verge. We'll pop a link in the retrohour.com at the show notes. Now, we have uh, we mentioned the revival of cassette tapes um, on the show a couple of months ago. Um, we were mainly looking at the hipster market, but there yeah. is another one. That there we is another remembered. market that uh, is currently got two million people involved in it and it is the prison market <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> never a prison called a market before <laughs> yeah well, well they're saying there's uh, two million people incarcerated in america yeah and cds are forbidden because they can be made into a weapon mp3 players are not allowed because some of them have wi-fi access so all they're allowed is cassette tapes because they can't make a sh- shank out of it or use it as a weapon so i guess there's Two million of these guys, and they're all sharing cassettes of all the latest stuff. There's probably uh, recent compilations of all the chart stuff, you know. Well, one thing that interests me about this as well is um, it says there are still companies, you know, more than you'd expect that are still making cassette tapes. For example, there's a company called Sub Pop um, who plans to reproduce all of its new releases on cassette this year. Because the market has had a bit of a revival, like you said, but, I mean, you know, Two million people, that is quite a substantial market, isn't it? You know, people yeah, that have I no guess I guess that might be a case of prisons around the world as well. You know. Yeah. Oh, it's um <laughs> it's got this great image of like these guys in like the, the orange jumpsuits doing mixtapes for each other. Yeah, that's what I thought. Because <laughs> I thought, you know, the market, you think, oh, cassettes coming back, it's gonna be these bearded hipster guys going into charity shops and buying cassette cases. But it's probably guys sharing gangster rap <laughs> and stuff in <laughs> in prison. So yeah. That's that's. I just thought that was a pretty interesting thing. Well, even reckon the company here. There's one called their National Audio Companies, um, and they're manufacturing a hundred thousand cassette tapes every day at the moment. Wow! For this market, okay. prison tapes to call them. So. Prison tapes. Ah, so yeah. that's uh, maybe we should try and get hold of some prison tapes and some mixes. <laughs> That'd be cool. It's a big market. We'll get the retro out, out on cassette tape. Yeah. Well, <laughs> moving on to another format. Uh, which is, <laughs> this is an absolutely insane story. I thought this was an April Fool's at first. But yeah, not. this is VHS. And uh, this um, this blog has basically uh, created this prophecy. Do you, you want to say the prophecy, Dan? Well, do you remember the um, Tom Cruise movie, Jerry Maguire? Yes, which, yeah, um, uh, the football coach, wasn't he? 19, or football mo- promoter. 1997 yeah. this came out. Um, it was a bit of an F film to begin with anyway. Yeah. Uh, this blog, I've come up with the idea, don't ask me how, but they want to get together every single VHS copy of Jerry Maguire in the world and build a giant pyramid of them all in the desert. I think they must have been pretty high when they came <laughs> up with this idea. Do, do you want to hear their drive for it? Have yeah, yeah. Hi. We're everything is terrible, but you already know that. We are currently in possession of 10,000 copies of Jerry Maguire on VHS. I know, it's not enough. Every day somebody asks me, what are you going to do with all those Jerry's? We're going to build a pyramid in the desert built only out of Jerry Maguire. And that's where you come in. We need you to go out there and get the rest of them. Sounds like fun, right? You can steal one from your grandmother's little box of VHS tapes. You could go to a thrift store and buy one for a quarter. It's that easy. Mail your copy to the address below. (laughs) Return them to their home. So uh, these guys, when you watch the video, they're kind of dressed up as these kind of like weird space beetles in cloaks. (laughs) It's it's very (laughs) strange, but it's made the national press. And um, there's a leaderboard. And currently a guy called Alec McNeely has contributed 1,299 <laughs> copies of Jerry Maguire. So uh, if you're having a bit of a clean out of your attic at any time and you uh, find a copy of that on VHS, then... Uh, Contribute to the pyramid. <laughs> no, I'm just thinking though, future civilizations who discover that, you know, in like 2,000 years. <laughs> Aliens land, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> that must have been the pinnacle of movie making in the 20th yeah. century. <laughs> well, you could go around the desert and you could find the E.T. hole <laughs> stuff the Jerry Maguire pyramid. There'll be all these new kind of dead format things appearing. What relics are we leaving for future generations? Yeah. <laughs> now, I thought this was quite an interesting uh, discussion on Reddit um, because you often see pictures of like guys' collections and all that, and they've got these like massive rooms with all the machines all laid out. It's how do you store or display your computers and consoles? I cover mine with sheets because I've got a cat. <laughs> <laughs> and within a week, they will be covered in cat hair and dust. <laughs> is... You've got CRT monitors as well. Does your cat sit on the back? No, because they're not on that often. That's the problem. Because yeah. uh, I've just moved into a new house. I need to set everything up. But um, underneath my kind of TV is a little dark spot with like 
old consoles in there. Dreamcast and a kind of Sega Saturn that you owe me. <laughs> and, you <Yeah>. know, everything's <laughs> there. Yeah, they're all hidden away, though, and protected at the moment. I look at, like, your guys who've got like, these massive rooms and they're all kind of set up around the room. And, you know, a lot of mine are in cupboards and wardrobes and stuff, and I kind of pull them out as and when I need them. I find, to be honest, that I get someone like you around, Dan, and we get really drunk, and then if it's all laid out there, we get overexcited and break everything. <laughs> and it's usually You mean I'll spill rare. a drink on something? Yeah, yeah, something like that. You know? But I mean, I've got like, um, you know, I'd say probably my rarest system. I've got an Atari Jaguar with the CD-ROM unit yeah. working on it and uh, I kind of keep that stored under a table, you know, in quite a safe place. Yeah, well, I have got the, the signed Amiga 1200 by all the machine, um, musicians mm. and that's on a shelf with a light beaming down on it like some kind of worship thing <laughs> <laughs> do you do like a little ritual before every morning yeah every morning i pray to it <laughs> and your cat your cat can't reach that now no no yeah she, she hasn't got the skills to get up there yet so but it's uh you know if you, if you guys have got any pictures of your setups i think because we've been doing quite a bit on facebook recently it's always quite interesting to see people's gaming rooms and all that kind of thing yeah i saw a thing that they were doing a show your amiga rig set up on the uh amiga amigos podcast okay yeah so if you check their blog mm -hmm. there might be quite a few user submitted rigs there as well mine's not clean enough to submit you have to send yours in Dan, <laughs> yeah, to show to, as I'll an have example to, have to tidy up as well yeah um but yeah i mean you know we'd love to see your guys uh gaming rigs and uh you know your retro setup so we'll uh we'll post this on our facebook group to search for the retro hour podcast yeah even if it's modern stuff if it's comfortable mm -hmm. and it looks like a nice place to have a beer then, uh, yeah we'd love to see it we'd love to have a look yeah. now um obviously the presidential race has been big news in america and uh, so much so it's actually been made into a video game yeah <laughs> this is a, a really good little video game. They've kind of done it in a 8-bit style. And uh, the video on YouTube, it looks like it's been captured in VHS. The tracking is like all <laughs> gone on it. But the people in there are Donald Trump and uh, Hillary Clinton. Now, like you said, these are kind of done in like uh, that proper kind of 8-bit style. Yeah, and they've got guys in the background going, build that wall. <laughs> <laughs> but um, even the, the way the game plays, it looks a bit like you get Donald Trump running along and jumping over walls and he's got to collect bricks and that to build his wall. Well, he's wall. got to collect cash and bricks. Yeah. Cash and bricks. <laughs> That's it. it looks a bit like Paperboy, the way it kind of scrolls along. <laughs> yeah, there's a really trippy scene in it, like Robotron as well, where Donald Trump's... Uh, gets abducted by aliens and yeah it's just completely <laughs> insane but also uh hillary clinton seems to be running or collecting emails or something like this the way they've recorded this as well the fact that like you said it's um it looks like it has been taped on a vhs tape yeah it looks like if you didn't tell me what this game was i'd have thought was that like an old you know atari st game or something from back then but it's uh it's very well done yeah i kind of like this faking old retro games and new subjects. It's quite a, a cute little cheeky thing to be doing. There was actually, I've been watching, you know, um, LGR on YouTube. Yeah. I watched yeah. a few of his old videos the other day and until about two years ago, he used to film all his videos on like an old, um, you know, tape camcorder. Yeah, yeah. And there's something about watching them, so I know he does like full HD quality 1080p ones now, which, you know, slick as anything, really well produced. But there's something about watching the old ones that you filmed on like a camcorder. It makes it look like they were filmed like, you know, in 1989 or something. Well, have you seen that LGR thrifts? Yeah. So he had like camera he used to wear in his glasses mm -hmm. to go around the thrift shop. He later upgraded it. I can't watch the upgraded one because it's like, it just doesn't feel nice. It's too super quality. Yeah. Like the other one, it's a bit rough and you can feel like, you know, you're going around an actual thrift shop. Uh, There's yeah. something to be said about, yeah, being too well produced, isn't there? Yeah, that so. kind of aesthetic of, uh, you know, a bit graininess and yeah. But it's kind of warm to me, you know, that feeling. Yeah, well, yeah. it's more nostalgic, isn't it? It brings it back to you. Yeah. Now, we're going to finish on a story about Sony that's been all over Reddit and stuff recently, and this was pretty shocking. Now, this was um, a guy, he's 26 years old, mm -hmm. um, his name is Jihad, yeah. and he's been a, a PlayStation gamer ever since the PS1, you know, his PS2, PS3, PS, up to the PS4 now, and he's had a, a PSN account um, for about seven years. And the other day, he tried to log on, uh, play a game on his PS4, and a message popped up from Sony saying that he'd, uh, he'd been banned for misuse. Wow. So he's like, oh, what have I done here? You know, so went on. He said, check your email for more details. Went on to his email. And it turned out they banned him because his username was IGHAD. But that's his name. <laughs> that's, and to be honest, the word jihad, it, it, it's not an offensive term. It's an actual term 
an Islamic term, but mm-hmm. it's not an offensive one. It's just a context that it's been used in recently yeah. has deemed it that way. It's not this guy's fault. Like, it's, 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 it's his it. name, you know what I mean? Yeah. He's had it since birth. Yeah. So, you know, he's actually posted on here, you know, why legally using my actual name, which has multiple good meanings, why is that breaking the terms of service when only in the last few years has it certainly got, certainly got a bad meaning in the media? So he emailed them back and said, you know, look, um, I'm willing to change my name and all that. Um, and then someone from Sony replied after a couple of hours, said, all right, okay, we'll let you do it. Well, that what that lets what it seems to me was, it seems to me that, that, that they'd probably have something that check names, like, yeah. you know, a bot that well, was just searching on terms. Yeah, That's what he thought. And then, so someone from Sony replied, said, all right, we understand, we're going to let you change your name. Okay. And then, all of a sudden, an hour later, someone else replied, going, actually, no, we'll change our mind, you can't appeal it, you're permabanned, that's it, your account's gone. Wow, so he's lost all of his games. He had seven Five. years' worth of digital download games that he paid for that had suddenly all gone, everything. And he was probably paid the original price on those games, so now they've dropped price and he's... Yeah, oh my God. You're talking probably thousands of pounds worth of games. That's insane. Now, eventually, this campaign has made a lot of the gaming blogs and stuff. Um, yeah. You know, Kotaku, Game Informer, um, and also this has been big on Reddit. There's been a bit of a Twitter campaign and stuff as well. Eventually, Sony, obviously, because of all the publicity, yeah. have reached out to him and been like, all right, we'll let you change your name. And apparently only took like two minutes. He's got his account back now with yeah. his digital games, but he's lost all his trophies, all his friend list has gone and everything. Uh, yeah, it's just overstepping the mark, I think, definitely. Well, it's like, um, it just, uh, to me, it highlights the danger of buying all your games digitally. What if your name was like Theresa Green? Like, you know, trees are green or, mm. you know, something like that. Something that sounded funny and you'd been teased for the whole of your life about it. And then suddenly, Sony were like, right, you're banned. Yeah. <laughs> it would be like awful. An insult to injury, Sony. Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> but it's like, it's a fact that, I mean, and this guy makes a point here. If a Sony employee feels like banning you, you've lost everything. You know, all yeah. the money you've spent. And it's in their terms of service that, you know, they don't have to give you a back or a refund or anything. You lose your entire gaming library. Yeah, they're, they're, they're a private company. They're not accountable to anything. You know, they're not publicly funded. They can do what they want. Yeah, but it's really, like... But well, he said even... He, he it's couldn't, not good press, is it? Well, he couldn't play his games he downloaded because it has to check with the servers. And if his oh, account's so he not couldn't there, even log on and get his stats or anything? Or? And even the games on his hard disk that he downloaded, he couldn't play them. Like, you know, the what, ones so that if he had another account and then tried to... You sign another account that you lose all your... You can't play the games you bought on the old account. Oh, God. It's so, bad, so he's totally off the PSN. Yeah, I mean, well, like I said, they're letting back on now, but I mean, I imagine how many other people have kind of been banned and then lost, you know, not, never got their accounts back, but it kind of proves that, you know, you're buying all your games digitally, they can take it away like that. Yeah, that's a scary thing, you know, and uh, everything's like that now as well, Valve, and mm-hmm. yeah, I, you make an interesting point that they can just revoke it if you haven't got digital, uh, if you've got digital copies, if you've got physical ones install it offline or whatever, <laughs> but, yeah. you know. Well, essentially, it's kind of like, you know, imagine you say a bad word on PSN. It's like them breaking down your front door, coming in and just nicking all your games and putting them in a bag and walking out, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's what it is, totally. Yeah, clearing your games collection. I think, you know, as kind of gaming goes forward and it does all kind of, you know, which it inevitably will on consoles, go all digital in the future, that's you know, got to be something people have to think about or, you know, there's got to be some way of addressing it. There's got to be some kind of, not authority, but some kind of, Set of rules that you guys stick to. Yeah. If, if they don't, then they get slapped. Chop your fingers up. <laughs> yeah, that would be it. <laughs> We'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, maybe you've had something happen to you similarly, you know. It's, uh, I'm sure there are other people out there. Yeah, I'm sure there's many stories of uh, people with names that have been taken incorrectly online. Yeah. And uh, they've been punished unfairly. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, if you want to get in touch, any topics for next week's show, anything you want to send in to us, we always appreciate that. Yeah, submit the news. We're now actually looking at our submitted <laughs> news. So. And it saves us a job as well. Come yeah. on. <laughs> right, thank you for checking out episode number 27 of The Retro Hour. We'll be out again next Friday. Of course, download it from our website, theretrohour.com. Get it on SoundCloud, Stitcher, YouTube, all your favourite podcast clients. And now, stay with us for the next half an hour. We're going to talk music, we're going to talk Commodore 64s, we're going to talk Amigas. With Chris Holsbeck, the guy I've always wanted to have on the show. Right, Chris Weller, welcome to the Retro Hour podcast. Thank you for coming on. Oh, uh, my pleasure. I have not prepared anything, though, so if you grill me about something... um, I guess I have to wing it. (laughs) (laughs) We'll get the real answers then. 
So, well, let's start right at the beginning then, Chris. So what was your first um, experience with a computer? Where did it all start? First experience with a computer. Hmm. I actually, I tried to program... Here's a little bit tidbit that I never told anybody. When I was about uh, six or seven years old, I tried to program a, a chess uh, playing program into a calculator. Wow. An electronic calculator. Obviously, that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the calculator actually had no programming uh, abilities whatsoever. Um, but as a as a child, you know, I thought that's how it works. You know, you punch in some numbers and you get some numbers out, and I mapped them to the to the chessboard, and uh, that was that. Yeah, that's crazy. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but the first um, real experience with programming was on a um, business type machine from my uncle, who had gone into computers in the early eighties. And uh, I programmed a little bit of Microsoft Basic. And then that machine had no abilities in terms of like graphics that you could do with Basic. So it was like really simple programs that would Text post some up. questions and then something would happen inside the program and then would post an answer or something. But I had caught the bug with that, so to speak. And the other thing, my passion of music was that I wanted to, um, you know, my family was very musical and we had pianos in the house and my grandma was a known piano teacher in town. And um, But I was interested in synthesizers. Uh -huh. That's what I developed an interest in. And it, I was fascinated by the whole concept of a synthesizer. But my family couldn't afford one. Then uh, I read that the Commodore 64 which was advertised in a magazine, had a real synthesizer sound chip. And that was then the uh, my, my entry point for making synthesizer music. I wanted to own a Commodore 64. Saved up money for that. And um, with the help of my grandma, I was finally able to buy one. And uh, then I thought like, wow, I bring this home and I make music right away. And nope, <laughs> the machine uh, was just staring at me with like a blinking cursor and that was it. Ready. <laughs> ready, exactly. Ready. Ready for what? Re I'm ready to make music here. <laughs> What can I do? And nothing. I mean, there was no software there that would enable you to really use the sound chip to its potential. So I had to learn programming. But um, I, I think the first year I was only playing games. <laughs> With your piano experience, did that help going onto the C64? I knew, I knew what music was. I had two years of piano lessons from my grandma, but I gave up because... She was a little bit old school, too old school for me. She would uh, sometimes hit her students with a stick. <laughs> really old school. So, yeah, really old school. And uh, that wasn't fun. So from that point on, I played on family pianos um, by listening to the radio. And I ju would just play the melodies that I heard. Because mm -hmm. I had an old piano teacher and she also used to, um, if you bent your fingers, hit you with a stick on, <laughs> yeah. the, on the fingers. That, that kind of thing. Straighten I mean, up, yeah. yeah. You know, my room was across from her room where she taught. And um, there wasn't a day when, when there wasn't like a student totally, um, you know, getting hysterical and tears and stuff like that because she was quite harsh. <laughs> you learned the hard way. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so, but yeah, I knew what music was. I had the basics. And uh, then it was just like, how do I program this Commodore 64? So then I learned, um, you know, I had some basic experience, um, but that wasn't good enough for creating games or music. So I learned machine language uh, assembly. And uh, with the help of a friend, uh, he, he was really good. He had already sold a game to a company, was working on a second commercial game and um, studied myself. And with the help um, of my friend, I became a pretty good assembly programming programmer. But then, I, the, then the idea was that I wanted to create games, mm -hmm. but I wasn't that good at at it um, and finally I went into making music. 
Well, what was the uh, Commodore 64 scene like in um, in Germany at the time then? Um, yeah, that was interesting. It was just before that that scene of like coders and 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 you know game game crackers and uh, and demo coders and stuff like that came up. So I I never was really exposed to that. Mm-hmm. And so I created my own programs. I made music for my friend's game then. That was the first music I did. Um, was a little game called uh, Planet of War. And then uh, the next thing was a contest in the um, most prominent magazine in Germany, 64 magazine, mm-hmm. uh, where they asked for music with the Commodore 64. And I sent a piece in. I wanted to get on the cover disc you know, get at least like one of the uh, top 10 entries. And to my surprise, I won that. <laughs> were, you, were you shocked then, were you? Yeah, I was really shocked. Um, so that piece was called Shades, and that really started my career um, because uh, that showed me like a way to do something and actually earn money with music on the Commodore 64. And in short succession, I made an editor program that would simplify the music editing. And that was called the Sound Monitor. Mm-hmm. And with, with those things, I actually called up game companies in Germany to um, get a job or get like gigs. And uh, the biggest one was uh, Rainbow Arts. And I called them up and they offered me a job in-house right away. Well, your sound monitor program, a lot of people kind of regard that as like the, the first tracker, really. You know, the kind of Amiga Pro Tracker and all that were really inspired by your sound monitor program. I mean, before that, like you mentioned, it was all machine code. Did that really change everything for you when you um, were using sound monitor? It would make uh, the entry of the music um, data much easier. Much, much easier. And that was the goal of the whole program because before you had to like hack the uh, the numbers directly into memory mm. and that was extremely tedious so the sound monitor would already improve that workflow you know by 500 percent so um what was it like at that age going to kind of a company like rainbow arts yeah really crazy because i was also lucky because i didn't really know another career nothing was really there i was just like keeping in school uh, to figure it out and when that opportunity presented itself i said you know like um this this is my chance and i uh, skipped the last one and a half years in the um, extended school in germany Mm -hmm and went to work right away and uh, I think I was way ahead of uh, my friends and contemporaries and it was really amazing. Well Rainbow Arts, I mean anyone that played on like the Commodore or the Amiga um, will be familiar with the games that you know that software has released. What was the atmosphere like working there in in the early days and what was it what was kind of the you know the the corporate culture and uh, the, the atmosphere of being in the building and hanging around with everyone what was it what was it like being there? Extremely open. The, um, the the boss of Rainbow Arts really understood at the time, you know, how to treat the talent and and how to how to get them excited about things. So there were almost no rules, um, and we spent probably way more than eight or ten hours a day on on our stuff. And I worked through through nights and stuff like that. And it was it was a very open atmosphere. Which was kind of funny because um, there were also some some guys working there that were a little bit older and they had families and stuff. So uh, coming in there as like the young uh, 18-year-old, 19-year-old guy and and doing all this crazy stuff and working those crazy hours created some animosity inside. And uh, it, it took me like three or four months to make friends with those people. Right. Uh, in the beginning, they, they saw me a little bit as the wise ass who's coming in uh, because I actually showed them some programming tricks that they didn't know. Um, they, they were not able to do like um, a smooth scrolling um, at the time in... in um, you know, 50 frames a second. And I showed them how it's done. And when I first proposed it, I said, it's impossible. 
and then I showed them and that kind of like you know, I mean, I was the audio guy and not, <laughs> not the game wrong. <laughs> so, but who does this kid think funny. he is? <laughs> I, you know, I know, and then, I, then, then the terror would start. They would like, because I had like worked overnight and I slept during the day, they would like bang at my door just to, you know, screw with me. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but after a couple of months that normalized, we can be really good friends. Well, um, I read that the great Guiana sisters was inspired by a Madonna tune, uh, True Blue, for the bus. The, yeah, that's actually uh, that's actually interesting that you mentioned that. Um, there's two s- tracks that are considered the title tune, but really in reality it's the one that shows up during the um, loading artwork. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there was always like a part that would be loaded before the game which would show like an artwork play some music and then you would press space and then the rest of the game would load and then when when that was finished there was actually another tune playing and it was the what I call the menu tune but then you know as well as um, I do that uh, most games would like be spread as a crack um, not bought in the store so and the, the crack did away with that whole uh, first screen and the first music so most people out there consider the menu music the theme music <laughs> okay. which it's not so yeah so the 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 actual uh, Janus theme is inspired by Madonna True Blue it uses like the three quarter beat triplet kind of um, style and um yeah, so there, there's some truth to that. Well, you mentioned about um, you know a lot of crack copies of the game doing the rounds, and in part that was probably because it wasn't really on sale for very long, was it? Um, no, what, what it was there, only on sale for about three months or so before it had to be taken off the market because Nintendo threatened to sue the company for it being too similar to Mario Brothers. Did you expect that? I wasn't surprised, I have to say, because... Uh, uh, the, the the backstory of that is that one magazine in Germany was like totally um, excited about Mario Brothers, and that was an import at the time. It wasn't even sold in Germany. And the boss of Rainbow Art saw the excitement there and said, "Oh, some something like this game we could do in a few weeks." And the magazine guy said, "Well, if you could do that, then then I would get really high ratings in the 90s." And um, so was that. Um, we drove back to the company and there was a conference I remember like like a, a meeting and he said like we're gonna do a game like Super Mario Brothers and we'll, we'll call it the Great Jana Sisters so <laughs> you can imagine like and, the, and, and some of the in-game graphics looked extremely similar and the whole gameplay concept was, was the same and uh, so it was a little bit too close to the original well, if you uh, have any spare copies as well, you could probably make yourself a, a big book at the moment. Because on the <laughs> eBay, they seem to list the great Gianna sisters for the Amiga for around a thousand pounds a copy. <laughs> no way! Yeah. It's, it's it's crazy because I actually had a few copies um, in the beginning uh, because you know you you would get a few as a developer and they vanished over the years. Um, <laughs> few moves and then my move to to the US and they're just gone and I knew they were there I had several and now I'm like <laughs> I'm quite unhappy about that seeing the prices on eBay some very ri- rich removal men doing the rounds then yeah exactly <laughs> well speaking about the Commodore 64 scene I mean what, what did you think was um, so special about the C64 the fact that people still remember that system like 30 years down the line it, it was really the beginning beginning I think it had um it, as I mentioned, if you switched it on, not much would happen. I mean, if you buy a computer nowadays, it comes pre-installed with all kinds of apps and you can go on the internet and you have all the stuff that you can do right away. But with the Commodore 64, it was really uh, a trap experience if you would just switch it on and nothing would happen. Mm-hmm. So then, you know, like you would get a new game and it would really push the envelope of what was possible with the machine. I think the the hardware developers didn't even realize what they were putting in the hands of the developers, what they would make with the limited possibilities and then get like the latest tricks and stuff like that. And that was that was the main excitement, um, definitely for me. 
Well, I, I look at Commodore 64 demos now, and they're still like pushing the boundaries and doing stuff that people didn't realize it could exactly. do. Exactly. <laughs> it's crazy. Exactly. Isn't it? It's totally crazy. And that, that was really the exciting of the early machines. You know, you brought this thing home and then you were just amazed of what it could do. And, and if you were a developer, you would figure out new things. And that was super exciting. What was the uh, first reaction when you saw an Amiga? Unbelievable. I mean, that was definitely quite a step up. I mean, it's like going from a Volkswagen to a Ferrari or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> I mean, the, the graphics possibilities of, on the Commodore 64, it is 16 colors. On the Amiga, you had a palette of 4,096. It, it, to us, it looked like photorealistic. And then the, the sound chip also was very interesting for me because going from three channels synthesizer sound chip to four channels of sampling enhanced the capabilities quite a bit because... For sampling, you can sample chords, so then you you can enhance the capabilities of one channel by quite a bit, and and things like that, and use natural sounding instruments, real drums, and and everything. So that was very exciting for me. Well, um, you also invented a, a, a format which was the TFMX format. Um, could you talk more about that? I already started on the Commodore 64 actually. After the sound monitor, I developed it further and that eventually became TFMX. It's an essential feature was that uh, for every note that you would trigger, you could, um, you could uh, trigger a little script program, which I called Sound Macros. And with that, you could really like manipulate the sound chip on a frame by frame basis and change things. So you could do amazing, um, you, you could do things like play a little uh, hi hat kind of sound with the uh, noise waveform for like maybe one or two frames uh, with a fixed pitch and then switch over to like a bass tone or, or something else was a variable pitch that came from the node and then you would trigger that and it would it would sound like the hi-hat and the actual pitch note would sound at the same time mm -hmm. even though it, it was like in rapid succession and other tricks and there were like um, you could do branching and looping and all kinds of stuff so it would really like enhance enhance the capabilities things that I even didn't think of when I did the um, the, the replay driver or routine, I would uh, then enhance with the sound macros where you could really get creative with while you were composing a track. And that concept uh, I ported over to the Amiga immediately and that became TFMX Amiga then. And even it, it survived up until the um, Nintendo 64 in the form of music, which I co-developed with uh, Factor 5, and that became actually the third-party sound tool for Nintendo. Getting back to the Amiga then, do you, um, when did you get your first Amiga, and do you remember that day that you first brought it home? Yes, in fact, uh, I was the second person in our town that owned one because I used the money from the uh, Shades, a contest and the money from the uh, sound monitor uh, program, which I also sold to a magazine. Uh, I used that uh, together to buy an Amiga when it was like really early. It was an Amiga 1000. It still had only 256 kilobyte and it was, I think, 4,000 Deutschmarks. So a really expensive machine. And so I, I got it actually before I even joined Rainbow Arts in the uh, fall uh, or I think around Christmas of 86. You'd, you'd been composing for the C64. So I guess when you went onto the Amiga, your tunes were pretty small size because you were used to doing uh, kind of small, efficient tunes. Yes, exactly. Um, the, the biggest size there was the actual sampling of the instruments, but we would concentrate on keeping those also really small so they could be used during a game. I think I did not make music with the Amiga until about two years after I bought it. So for two years I was still doing Commodore 64 music before I actually started to get serious on the Amiga programming. 
Well, in hindsight, did you prefer composing on the 64 or the Amiga? Definitely Amiga. It was always like the next machine had more capabilities, more freedom to compose what you wanted to do. But of course, the Commodore 64 still holds very special place in my heart. And um, I wished, for example, that the Amiga would have added two SID sound chips yeah. Uh, together with the sampling capabilities, that would would have been even cooler. But, you know, I was always looking for the next generation. Well, to us as well, we know you for Turrican, which is an absolute masterpiece. Um, what was the inspiration behind that music? Yeah, I just, uh, for, for Turrican, I just wanted to do something a little bit inspired by the Japanese or the arcade um, music stuff. And it had to be fast, and for, for, for that kind of gameplay, it had to be like more like a rock uh, beat and stuff like that. But it was still very um, much synthesizer-driven too. So I just did exactly what, what I had always dreamt about when I, when I thought about like having synthesizers and uh, made that into a game soundtrack, and it fit perfectly for that kind of gameplay. Yeah, to us, it's just like sums up European gaming, <laughs> Turrican. It's an anthem, though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And, and the fact that people still, you know, fondly remember that. I mean, whenever you see those kind of, you know, um, polls of their favorite Amiga music, Turrican and Turrican 2 are always in there. That must be totally. like, in quite, fact, quite an for honor. Turrican 2, um, there's, there's another two things. First off, um, we really pushed the envelope on the Amiga there by um, enhancing the uh, voice or uh, channel capability from four channels to seven, which um, I enlisted the help um, of uh, Jochen Hippel, who was an Atari ST programmer, a really fantastic programmer. And he had done like an emulation of the Amiga sound chip uh, with the CPU on the Atari ST. So he no could <laughs> actually play the four channel um, mods and, and TFMX stuff and things like that on the Atari ST. And we had a very good relationship. We, we were very friendly. And he um, sent me his source code. And I modified it back onto the Amiga and enhanced it a little bit so it could work inside my TFMX. And so the four channels um, mixed on the CPU plus the three remaining Amiga channels became my seven voice system. And uh, that was first used in Tarakan 2. And I guess that trick later on was used for pieces of software like Octomed Sound Studio and stuff. Yeah, actually, the Octomed came out like a couple months before I did uh, Seven Voice TFMX and the um, Tarakan 2, but I didn't like the sound of it. Um, I tried it out and it all sounded grainy on all channels. That's because they uh, mixed always two channels into one Amiga channel. So four times two becomes eight, um, but all of them would lose fidelity. So my idea was if I use um, Jochen's um, mixing assembly code and port that back onto the Amiga, then um, I mix that down to one Amiga channel and I have still three pristine ones. It's one channel less than Octomate, but it sounds so much better. You mentioned the Atari ST in there as well. I mean, did you ever do any work on the ST? Because I know that the sound capabilities of the ST were a lot more limited than the Amiga, weren't they? Yeah, I did a, I did a few uh, projects on the Atari ST. Um, the most prominent was, I think, the Jim Power uh, game. And uh, the in-game tunes are definitely uh, the PSG, so just the sound chip. And that was quite limited. That was even more limited than the uh, SID chip of the Commodore 64. Uh, but nevertheless, it was fun to do. And I had actually a little hardware that a friend made um, that could be attached to the Amiga computer. And that had the Atari ST sound chip on there. So I could actually use my TFMX program with the Atari ST sound chip. <laughs> <laughs> when you were um, composing on the Amiga as well, one thing I always remember about the Amiga is it had really wide stereo separation. Um, was that ever a challenge in making music for it? Um, not really. I mean, most people would listen to it through one of the Commodore monitors, like the 1084, mm -hmm. which had a mono speaker. 
So it would just like um, uh, mix it down to mono essentially. And I had a little mixing board um, and I would narrow the stereo spectrum. So that was okay. Um, but yeah, it, if you would hook it up to a stereo, but then it was okay if you, if you um, played it through speakers, it would kind of also blend. Uh, the worst would be if you would directly put it into head into headphones. It would be quite jarring. Well, um, we noticed as well that you had a massive symphony orchestra doing your music. That must have been amazing to see a whole orchestra playing your tunes. Absolutely. That was in 2007, um, the Symphonic Shades concert. And uh, what was it? I think it was 2008. Mm -hmm. But anyway... Uh, it's unbelievable when you're sitting there as a composer, particularly for the stuff that I did. I never thought that it would be ever played by a symphony orchestra. And to sit there, I had like tears running down my cheeks the whole performance. It's amazing because I hear it and I get goosebumps even just seeing an orchestra playing, you know, C64 tunes. <laughs> but, you know, creating yeah. it, it must be mind blowing. Yeah, I had really fantastic um, arrangers and orchestrators helping with this. Um, uh, one of them was, uh, or the main guy was Jano Valton, which also is like a scene guy from the Amiga days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was really an amazing experience. And we're, we're kind of doing it again. I don't know if you um, heard, but I recently did my third successful Kickstarter mm -hmm. for actually a Tarakan 2 project again, um, where we're recording with a full orchestra, uh, a full disc of music from Tarakan 2. That's going to be amazing. And yeah. uh, another Kickstarter I also saw was um, your piano collection, which right. really interests me because I've been trying to play a lot of Amiga songs on piano and I kind of have to sit there and translate them myself, you know. So this Excellent. Is great. Yeah. Have you actually participated? Did you get the... Um, no, no, the I haven't score? because I've, I've looked at it kind of retrospectively, but I, I, I may be getting involved and trying to get that... I think your piano skills are a lot beyond mine. No. <laughs> yeah, you can you can still get the whole book as a PDF, um, and you can print out the scores one by one. And they are um, in two versions in the book, as the exact version as it's on the on the soundtrack or the CD, and then uh, a beginner's version as well. So we made sure that uh, every skill level can take a shot at it. And I saw you had a 12-inch double vinyl as well. That must be <laughs> really nice holding your music in vinyl form. It's really cool, particularly since it's double vinyl. You fold it open, and there's all these like photographs from, you know, from 30 years of almost 30 years of my career in there, and that's pretty cool. Which is, by the way, this year is my anniversary. 30 years in the business. Oh, congratulations! So I will, yeah. I will be at Gamescom next month to celebrate that properly. Yeah, anybody who comes to Gamescom can meet me there. I have a, a booth in the retro area. And that's in uh, Cologne, isn't it? It's in Cologne, yes. Well, talking about doing these like live albums and stuff like you have been, how much of a different world is it composing with real instruments compared to like the C64 and the Amiga, for example? Well, for me, it's really just the music, you know, melodies, um, bass and, and chords and stuff like that. And the rest is like, it depends, you know, I mean, what you want if you do it electronically or with, with um, you know, real instruments, um, that's, that's a secondary thing. But it's super nice, of course, if somebody who is really a virtuoso of, on the instrument uh, puts their heart and soul into the composition that you do. Mm -hmm. Um, that's obviously very rewarding. Because I know the S Symphonic Shades, um, Thomas was like a fan of yours, and did he get in touch with you and just tell you he was going to do this and invite you along? Absolutely. In <laughs> fact, he I remember him uh, writing me letters as a teenager, um, and he said, oh, I'm your biggest fan, and uh, I love your music so much, and stuff like that. And I said, like, okay, I'm getting letters like this all the time. Um, but um, uh, it turned out he, he is my biggest fan because he made that whole thing possible and I have to really thank him for that. Are you still amazed that people are interested in your music and that there's still a Commodore 64 scene? Amazed and very grateful because uh, I really value all my fans and um, couldn't be happier. Do you still have a Commodore 64 and Amiga? Uh, I still have 
Um, I still have both machines, but they're not currently in my immediate possession. I actually loaned them to a traveling exhibition. And they're going to be in Cologne, so we're going to be reunited <laughs> um, for 30 years and they, they, they will be on exhibit there and uh, the Commodore 64 had given up the ghost a couple of years ago but it was restored um, by somebody who knows about the electronics and they had some chips that needed to be replaced um, and now I think it's in running condition again Oh, you can repair anything on those machines. They're kind of indestructible, really, aren't they? There's always a way of getting yes, them going yes. again. <laughs> but I actually, nowadays, if I if I dabble or play around with, um, with that stuff, I just fire up an emulator. The emulators have gotten really good by now, and they're kept alive by the, uh, by the scene. I think for the foreseeable future, I will always have access if I want to run. In fact, I'm, I'm doing a project right now um, for a Spanish company where I'm doing original Amiga music. Uh, they, they're developing a game that will run on the Amiga 500. Oh, wow. And then later they're planning to port it over to PC and enhance it. But I'm actually working again in the TFMX, in the emulator. Are you having to re Amiga. relearn all that again then? <laughs> is it kind of a learning process going back to that then? <laughs> It sure is. Uh, I, I'm, I'm quite amazed what, what um, we've all done back then because it seems to be quite tedious right now. But um, I'm getting back into the groove. When can we expect that then? Uh, I don't exactly know what the timetable is. Um, I think the announcement is supposed to come sometime this summer or in early fall. And, um, but I don't know when they are finishing it. It's obviously like a labor of love. Two more weeks, so. probably. <laughs> <laughs> Two more weeks, exactly. <laughs> well, you heard it here first. <laughs> um, so there's been lots of kind of recent commercial artists, uh, Timberland and a few others that have been stealing samples of C64 tunes. Have you had any uh, experience of this? Uh, not like the Timberland thing, which mm -hmm. I also followed and I'm quite amazed that uh, they got away with it. I know that there was another one um, that was covered. Was that the Commodore 64 tune? The Cancraft 400? Oh, yeah, it's or whatever. Yeah, um, yeah. At least there was some kind of settlement there where the original composer got a couple of bucks. I ha actually had an official request uh, by Scooter to cover one of my songs, and that made me a few bucks. But uh, I also had like one remix from a DJ or. or DJ team or whatever that was not authorized and I was quite unhappy about it but after consulting with some uh, lawyers I decided not to go after them because it would have cost more for the all the legal fees than yeah. what we could probably ex extract from there so but um, I'm yeah obviously I've pissed about it um, particularly since if people ask me I'm usually um, pretty easy to uh, get to an agreement. It, it's quite interesting but, yeah. that, that it's kind of become a bit more mainstream now and you know these artists are kind of looking at that scene for um, samples and that kind of thing. Right. And and I don't mind, you know, like um, the, to to get like the style of a C64 in there, you know, if somebody wants to use those C64 Arpeggio chords or whatever um, in their music, that's that's one thing. But stealing like a melody is, is um, really um, quite despicable. Poor form, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Chris, it's been amazing having you on the show this week. Um, thank you so much for sharing your stories. It's just been great to, you know, as guys who grew up playing games with your soundtracks on, it's been amazing to talk to the man who came up with all these amazing tracks. Well, thank you, guys. I, I definitely have to check out your your podcast. Yeah, you've got um, lo lots of your friends are on it. So <laughs> we'll definitely cool. link you. Well, everyone we talked to, we've had, like, you know, many Commodore 64 and Amiga musicians on. You're always a the guy they mention as one of their uh, greatest influences. And, uh, you know, so it, it's just great to have you on. Well, thank Thank you so much, guys. And if people want to keep up to date with what you're up to now, then um, where, where can they head to and what have you got coming up? If you go to uh, my main site, hulspec.com, there's a couple links there, you know, where you can find my music. I'm on basically all the outlets, including Spotify. If you want to listen for free, you can stream it there. Um, my favorite site is Bandcamp. If you're an audiophile, you can download it as, um, I think they're even offering Wave now. So you get the full CD quality um, 
flak and other things and uh, so yeah that's that's a great site and uh, then the that latest Kickstarter, we're still extending it on Megaphone. If somebody is interested in Tarek and Two music with full orchestra, full album, um, it's on megafounder.com and you can still get in on the action there. Again, with a double vinyl <laughs> for the Ooh, real collectors. Nice. <laughs> Absolutely. I think they'll be worth a fortune in the future, though, as well. These, you know, li very limited. It could editions. be because we're, we're always like limiting that and we're sticking to it. So there's no more units that will be pressed after that whole thing. Uh, so they will appreciate over the years. Get them in while fact, you can. My, <laughs> my uh, Tarek and Soundtrack anthology is uh, regularly um, offered on eBay for like $300 or so. They'll be up to uh, Guiana sister prices. <laughs> <laughs> Could be eventually, yeah. Well, amazing, Chris. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, guys. And thanks to all the fans out there. Excellent. Um, and uh, come and see you in Cologne next month. Yes, please. <laughs>